Krista. Matthew chapter 19. We'll see how far we get. So <clears throat> now, so it's kind of a transition to potentially a new period of time. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit have eternal life? So for what it's worth, between here uh, and Luke's gospel and I believe Mark's gospel, Luke uh, 18, oh, is that right? I don't see it. Mark 10, Mark 10 is the rich young ruler, not the beginning of Mark, marriage, divorce, oh, the rich young ruler, here we go, and then Luke 18, 18. Luke is so long. There we go. Back in the Luke. We're getting really close to the Passion Week here. Luke 18, 18. Yes, a certain ruler. We know he's rich. I think Matthew's the one who tells us he's young. So he gets the name the Rich Young Ruler. You have to put together your pieces to get that title. So this guy is a rich person. He's a young man. And he's a ruler. So he's doing very well for himself. And you'll notice he asked Jesus, what does he need to do? He's probably a guy who's accomplished a lot on his own. He's probably, you know, in general, a good hard worker, all good qualities and good traits. But he also probably has it in his mind that because of who he is and what he's done, that he'll be able to get in heaven because of him, because he's so good and he's so rich. And he's so young. I'm not sure if the young part helps, but and so Jesus, why do you call me good? There's no one as good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So this question, sometimes people have been confused, thinking, well, is Jesus saying that he's not good? See, Jesus, Jesus never says he's not good. But he's trying to probe this guy to see if he realizes what he says. You know, you call me good, but only God is good. And maybe it's to get the guy thinking, to get the guy to wrap his brain around who he's talking to. And he tells him, well, keep the commandments then. Now, again, I think Jesus knows what he's doing. He's, uh, he's luring this guy in or he's bringing out these ideas. Sometimes we have to ask questions and, and go a roundabout way. But that helps unpack the situation and it helps open up what we're really talking about here. And so he says to him, which ones? Which commandments? And Jesus said, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not cheat, steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? I think that's the idea is he assumed, and I think as we've looked at Jesus' other teachings, like the Sermon on the Mount, I bet you that guy didn't meet Jesus' qualifications when you examine how he defines those things. But oh, I've kept all these things from my youth. The guy wants Jesus to affirm him. And so Jesus said to him, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, I can't recall if it is Mark's gospel or um, oh, it's Luke here. In Luke 24, and we'll see it in Matthew. But let's just see here. Luke 24, it says, Luke 1824 says, When Jesus saw that he became sorrowful, the rich young ruler, 
he said, you know, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? I actually wasn't what I was looking for. Um, but it was when, I think it's Mark 10, 10, where it talks about Jesus having compassion on the guy. Jesus sees, uh, verse 21, you know, Jesus loved him. He looked at it, looking at him and he loved him. And he gave him this information. So Jesus loved this guy and he wanted to see the best for this guy. But the man here, what he tells him to sell is all of his belongings. Verse, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew. In Matthew, verse 22, it says, When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so this is where Jesus was trying to dig down to the heart of the issue. And I think the simple thing is this, is that whether you come to the Lord with many problems or relatively few problems, whether you come with great wealth or no wealth, whether you come with everything or nothing, all God wants is for your submission, your faith, to be real. And so you find where when the man says, well, let me go and bury my father first, right? Here, to give away his possessions. What Jesus was helping these people realize was on the surface, they liked the idea of, all oh, being a Christian and loving God. Yeah, that sounds good. But Jesus shows them, if I asked of you the things that you love most, what will you choose? And I think that's a really freeing thing for the Christian to experience and realize. I remember on my way to a pastor's conference in California, we stopped at Calvary Chapel of Modesto, and Gail Irwin was there talking that day by chance. And as he went through Psalm 84, it made me really think about, would I be able to give up my one and only son? At the time, at least there was only one son. You know, would I, would I be willing to lay down my family if, if that was what God needed? And I walked away with a peace because I felt like I could say yes. Here, it was the riches. This man had great riches. Jesus says, well, sell your riches and then come follow me. You're not going to need all these riches if you're going to follow me. And that was very literal for this man in this scenario. And so in verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice he doesn't say impossible or that they won't or that they're, well, he just says that it's hard. Why is it hard? I think it's when we have what you might consider great possessions on earth, it becomes harder to focus on our heavenly possessions. And we may say we believe that heaven is real, but do our actions really reflect that? And that's the idea that 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about the, the world dissolving and everything burning with fervent heat. That everything we have in this world will be gone one day. And really the only investments that will last are in heaven. And so the question is, is if I believe I'm going to heaven to a, a place with reward waiting, and I'm going to leave behind this earth, and so anything I can pile up here is going to be gone, am I investing like I believe that to be true? You see, it's foolishness to spend all your time and energy saving up for something that really doesn't count for anything. And so Jesus says, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you're interested, I've heard this taught wrong many times. Um, and a lot of people just learned it wrong. But 
and I'm, I'm probably wrong too, so that <laughs> here I go. But um, the camel through the eye of a needle, there's no archaeology or no ancient history that ever verifies that there was actually a gate called the eye of a needle that people had to try and get their camels through. That story has been floating, but there's never actually been any real evidence to verify that. But here is something that you can verify. From the Mishnah, the Jewish writings, uh, Verakoth 55b, if you want to find it yourself. They make reference to an elephant passing through the eye of a needle. The point is that this was a phrase that was used by the Jews to try and get an elephant through the eye of a needle, try and get a camel through the eye of a needle. And it's talking about a sewing needle, right? And so it's just a phrase that they understood, just like we have phrases that make sense to us that don't literally make sense. But he's saying it's hard. Why is it hard? And here's the funny thing. The context. Why would Jesus say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, look at how the disciples respond. This helps us understand why this is becoming a big topic. Because the disciples heard it and they were greatly astonished. They were shocked that Jesus would say such a thing. Because that wasn't the way they were raised. And they say, well, who can then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to him, surely I say to you that in the, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive 100 fold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Here is the confusion and the emphasis of the teaching. The Jews taught and that there is some truth to this too, so bear with. They taught that wealth, earthly wealth, was the direct correlating byproduct of one's spirituality and how much they love God and God loved them. If you love God, then you had lots of stuff. That God will financially bless those who love him. And the Jews taught that the poor were simply hated by God. End of story. And back then, things were a bit different than they are now. The overall, you know, you might think of people as poor in Jesus' time, and there were the poor, for sure. But also, the average working class would be kind of what we would think of as poor. I mean, the average working class who worked hard jobs and did that, remember, they didn't have a lot back then. So, the idea, though, is that God really must love the rich people. So when Jesus starts saying the opposite, no, it's actually hard for a rich man to go to heaven. It blew people's minds. And Peter seems to pick up on what Jesus is talking about, how the disciples had forsaken all to follow Jesus. And Jesus tells them, yeah, and for you who forsake, the things of this world to follow me, in heaven you'll receive a hundredfold. This is showing how a born-again believer understands that they are living for a whole lot more than this world. Now, you go through the Bible. God blessed Abraham with great riches. He blessed Job with great riches. He blessed Solomon and David with astronomic riches. Nicodemus Ben-Gurion, the third richest man of Israel, is the Nicodemus of Matthew or John chapter 3 and who will take Jesus down from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea. We don't know much about him, but the tomb that he had prepared for himself was a rich man's tomb. It was a tomb that only someone with a great amount of money could afford. And that's the one he donates for Jesus to rent for the weekend. <laughs> and so 
we see rich people. Uh, I can continue. Would you like more? Lydia, the seller of purple from the book of Acts. She was very wealthy. Um, again, you can move into the New Testament. You can look at the Old Testament. And so directly, directly, there's no reason why being wealthy is good or bad. Wealth is amoral. And honestly, people who live by Christian standards are often well off or they choose to live by a lower standard than they could. I.e., when people work hard, do all things without complaining and disputing, do all things as unto the Lord, they're honorable, they don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal. These people in the American workplace are going to succeed unless they choose perhaps to do a different thing because they feel God's called them to something else. And I see that all the time too. People who could have been successful businessmen choosing a much more humbler trade because it frees them up for ministry or whatever else. I mean, that's kind of the idea too, is that, you know, it's like, it's, it's a choice though that they make and it's their choice and they have the freedom to make that choice. But the emphasis is, is that usually by working by Christian standards, people actually end up doing very well for themselves. The Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat. The Bible speaks out against laziness and slothfulness. The Bible speaks out about people who try and live off the system, essentially. That's the whole, if you don't work, you don't eat. Paul made it really clear. You will look at giving the widows in James, uh, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And it's like the qualifications of a widow. And it's like, oh no, she has to be over 60. Uh, she has to be serving faithfully in the church. And if she doesn't meet these qualifications, there's more than that, you know, then don't give, don't support, don't support her. She's just trying to take from the church. It's like, it was really strict. They were very firm about this stuff. But the emphasis back to this is, is that quite often in the world with non-Christians is they are chasing after the money and they're living for the money. Or maybe they're living for the fame and notoriety that comes with their work. But they're living for something. Their heart is knit to something that's not God. And this rich young ruler was one of those people. Jesus could see it. It's Jesus. He knew. And so he took him down this line and he finally said, hey, sell off your possessions. And the guy walked away. I mean, you think about it where it's like he didn't even like keep talking or ask questions. It's just once he heard, I can't have my money, he walks. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham took God at his word and agreed. And then God stopped him. He says, no, Abraham, I'll provide the lamb. But I know where your heart's at. And I think that's, again, what this all gets down to is a heart issue. The heart issue is about who is your God? What is your God? And so the idea back then when Jesus was saying it's hard for a rich man to get the kingdom of heaven, that really was just to get the attention and shock and awe of the disciples because it contradicted everything they were taught. And he explains to them, it's really at the end of the day, God is wanting to see what you have been willing to sacrifice for him. When David was offered the temple mount where the temple would be built for free, David says very plainly, I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. David knew that the cost to him was measurable about what he was sacrificing and offering up to God. And the cost of the two mites of the widow was a great cost to that widow. And so at the end of the day, Jesus tells people to count the cost of following him. That's the idea. So there you have it. We're going to see a lot of rich people in heaven. We're going to see a lot of upper middle class people in heaven. 
we're going to see a lot of poorer people in heaven. So it just all depends. Mother Teresa was poor. Obviously not because she wasn't a hard worker and diligent, right? I mean, there's things like that. There's a lot of people who are rich or poor, and it's not even their reasons for it. But overall, I think what we find, the Bible promotes, one, that we have our hearts in the right place. And two, if we live by God's standards, we'll do well. Some of us maybe had bad starts because we weren't starting off with God's standards. But I think if we continue to live by God's standards, usually we do pretty well in this world because we live by a higher standard than other people live. So, all right. I hope that answers everyone's question. If you got more questions, just send me a message and I'll get back to you. All right. You guys take care and I will see you guys tomorrow.